Now, over this month and this series, we're talking more specifically to Christians about how to be a good steward with the things that God has given to us. Lysandra just read that verse just a, a second ago about how that every good gift comes from above. Everything that we have in life has been given to us by God. And he expects us as his followers to be a good steward of everything that he's given to us. And for some, that word steward may be a new word for you. You may not understand what it means. Basically, it means that you are responsible to take care of something that belongs to somebody else. So, for instance, if I'm going to go away for, to Hawaii for a couple of weeks. Oh, the dream, right? Um, so I'm going to go away for a couple of weeks, and I need somebody to watch over my house and all of my stuff while I'm gone. So I say, Colin, listen, I'm, you're going to be a steward of my house, my property, my stuff while I'm gone. All right, so I'm expecting Colin to take good care of my property and my stuff and handle my affairs. So he's got a choice to make. There we go, see? He's got a choice to make, right? How is he going to take care of what I have entrusted to him? Well, everything that you and I have has been entrusted to us by God. Some people have this false, a lot of Christians have this false idea that 10% of what I have belongs to God and the rest is mine. That's a lie. Everything that you and I have belongs to God. Everything. Your house, your car, your kids, your money, your strength, your intellect, all of it belongs to God. And we need to get out of this mindset that a little part belongs to him, and the rest is mine to do whatever I want. No, we have been entrusted by God with everything that we have. What are we going to do with it? And so we're in Matthew chapter number 6 as we kick off this series. We're going to be looking at these verses every single week to try to remind ourselves of the focus that we need to have, but also the barometer that is given to us to see if our heart is in the right place. So in Matthew chapter number 6, let's look at verse number 19. We're going to read down to verse number 21, then have a word of prayer together. It says this, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. Now one of the things I want you to go, just go back one real quick. When he says do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, he's not saying there's anything wrong with having money or stuff. All right, but that should not be our main motivation and focus in life is just amassing for the here and now. We have people in our congregation and people who are watching by way of live stream that are on opposite ends of the spectrum financially. We have some people who are struggling just to get by day in and day out. We have some other people that are financially a lot more well off. One, as far as... God's value is not better than the other. They're not, we don't have people who are more valuable because they have more stuff or more money. But he's not saying it's wrong to have stuff or money. It should not be our focus. So do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth. And he talks about where it's going to go. Verse number 20. All right, what should our priority be? But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moss nor wrath destroys, and where thieves do not break in and steal. And you, maybe you've heard the, the saying, you can't take it with you. Right? When you die, you can't take it with you. But I like what one person said, and I don't remember who said it. It wasn't me. If I knew it was, I'd give him credit. Said, you can't take it with you, but you can send it ahead. And you send it ahead by investing in the things that truly matter for eternity. And then he says this. All right, let's, let's do a heart check. Verse number 21, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So he gives us something where we can search and see what is truly important to us. And we talked about this a little bit last week. We could look into each of our bank accounts 
and see where we're putting our money, and that will tell us exactly what is important to us. Because some of us, we say our marriage is important to us, but if we go and look at the money, there's never money spent on dates, never money spent on working on our relationship, of going away together, of investing in one another. How important is that relationship really? We say our kids are important to us. All right, what does the money say? We say church and God is important to us. Well, does our bank account really back that up? Jesus says where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And we'll dive more into that in just a second. Let's have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day that you've given to us, and we are so grateful for all the things that you have blessed us with. Just the opportunity we have today. God, and we have people in this room who have come from all over this country and some from around the world, to, and they're here today in this place, in this country, and we are just so blessed even to be here. And we know our country is not perfect. There's a lot of issues, a lot of problems, but we are so blessed to be here. And God, I pray that we would be reminded of how important it is to faithfully use the things that you have blessed us for a cause that matters, not just here and now, but for all eternity. And I pray that you'd help each of us to take the steps financially we need to take so that we can be a better steward of what you've trusted us with. For some, that means developing a financial plan of how they're going to use their money day in and day out. God, for some, that means working a plan to pay off their debt. For others, that means investing it and putting their money to work for them in different ways. For others, it means giving to you like they're supposed to, like you want them to. Whatever the step is financially we need to take, God, help us to be able to take that today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, so as we get started here today, we're, we're, we're spending, as I mentioned, money talks. We're going to be talking about money all month long. And today we're going to be talking about finding financial freedom by getting out of debt. And what an exciting topic to talk about at church, right? Debt. Everybody loves talking about debt, right? No, none of us do. Now, when you talk about getting out of debt, that excites some of you. Some of you love the financial talks and all of that, and you are just geeking out this entire series. Most people aren't like you. Most people are like, this is going to be the most boring thing you've ever done. In fact, can I? He, he made sure to top off his coffee before we started, just in case it got a little boring and he could give himself a little boost of caffeine. So if you need a little caffeine boost, go get you a coffee. Uh, that's okay. We're beachside. We're pretty laid back and chill. That's fine. Um, but I thought maybe what better way to like get people excited than do like a little game show type thing to kick things off and get us started talking about debt. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to do, we're going to play name that debt. All right. So I'm going to give you an average debt in a particular category for Americans. And I want you to guess what the average debt is is for that. So, first of all, this is the average American debt. Just total collection, how much each American owes on average. Any ideas about what you think that is? Yes. 15,000? All right. Yeah. This is what you owe, the average American. All right, so we've got 15. Yes. 350,000? Okay, John? 250? All right, yes. 650? This is just the average American. We'll get the personal debt in just a second. Is it like credit card debt or mortgage debt? Yes. Yes. All right. So let's see what it is. I looked it up this morning, 104,000. Average American. So we've got some people that have a mortgage, then we have other people that don't have a mortgage, right? So all that kind of balances itself out. 
to the average per American is $104,000 in debt. I won't ask you if you're above that or below that today. All right? So let's move on to our next category. Average personal debt. All right? What do you think the average personal debt is? Jerry? 25? Okay. Six? Six thousand? All right. So we've got twenty-five thousand, six thousand. Any other thoughts? Eight fifty. Wow, that is really specific. That's Jeff. He's like a down to the cent kind of guy. It's got to be down to the cent. Yes. Twenty-five? The twelve. Okay. All right. Let's see. What is the average personal debt? Twenty-two thousand seven hundred thirteen dollars. I don't know why there's no cents. I bet that didn't round up exactly to the cent. But, so not, that's pretty close, $25,000, Jerry, that's pretty good. All right, what's our next category we have? Average unsecured personal loan. Unsecured personal loan. All right, any thoughts on that? What do you think that is? Three? 50,000. That's, a, that's, you go between three and 50, like that is. So we have no idea. <laughs> all right, any other thoughts? Jerry says 15, you say nine. All right, let's see, what is it? 11,829. It's the average, average unsecured. All right, one more category here, let's talk credit cards. Average credit card debt. Ten dollars, yeah. I don't think that's. Say that again. All right, thirty thousand. All right. Any other guesses? We got between ten dollars and like ten thousand. Yes. Twelve. All right. Thirty-five hundred. Okay. Yes. Twenty. All right. Yes. 80,000. What are you buying out of your credit card? Oh my gosh. We might have to do a week just on credit cards. All right, let's see what is the average credit card debt? $8,674. So, once again, I won't ask you if you're above that or below that. If you're guessing $50,000, you might be above that. If you're guessing 10, I hope you're below that. But but if you think about, you just think about these numbers that we talked about here a little bit. All right. Um, let's focus in on that $104,000 a person. You know, is it any wonder why we as Americans, many of us, feel so much financial pressure? We just have this weight that is bearing down on us. We're drowning in debt. And so today what we want to do is we want to talk about getting out from underneath that pressure and finding financial freedom by getting out of debt. So one of the things Jesus did is he taught us that our money is an indicator of our heart. Let's go back to these verses we read in Matthew chapter number 6 here. And I've already walked our way through them so we won't spend a lot of time here. But he says this, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So he says, hey, invest in the things that really matter. And especially as Americans, we have far too many followers of Jesus that their sole focus is financial prosperity in this life. Now, as I mentioned before, there's nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with being financially prosperous. My wish for every single one of you at Beachside is that you could get rid of your debt and you could get to a place where you are prospering financially. But not just for the here and now. Um, it's so that we can, all of us, more freely invest in the things that really matter. 
And I want to say this, and I won't put this on the screen for you, for those that take notes and you can get this. Being in financial bondage limits our investment in the things that really matter. Really matter. And this is the reason why it's important for us to get to a place where we can be financially prosperous because I do not want anything to limit what God lays on my heart to do for him. I don't want my foolishness and my bad decisions and my debt to limit what I can accomplish for God and ultimately for eternity, that investment. And so I want to work to a place where I can have that financial abundance so that when there are opportunities to give and to bless and to do good, I can do that. And then that's exactly what Paul told the Ephesians. He gives this list of things that you used to do before you came to faith in Jesus, and he says, don't do that anymore, but instead replace it with something good. And so one of the things that he tells us to do is, hey, those of you that used to steal, don't steal anymore. Like, as a follower of Jesus, that's a good principle to live by. Hey, don't steal anymore. But he says the opposite of that is, hey, instead, work with your hands, work hard, but the purpose for working hard, he tells us, is so that we can have to give to those who are in need. See, if we don't have, that limits some opportunities to invest in the things that really matter. And so we don't want to be in that financial bondage that will limit us. Think of Proverbs chapter 22, verse number 7. You may have heard this verse before. I want to bring it to your attention today as we're talking about finding that financial freedom and getting out of debt. It says this, The rich rules over the poor, and the borrower is the slave of the lender. All right? So when I get myself in debt, when you get yourself in debt, we are the slave to the ones that we are indebted to. And this is my challenge, especially for those who are younger in the room. We do have some kids in the room. We've got some teenagers in the room. Can I just tell you, there has never been a better opportunity for you to earn wealth. Like the opportunities for you to obtain financial abundance are abounding. And if you can learn right now where you are to avoid some of the issues that we have fallen into you'll be so much farther ahead than so many other people. And one of the things, if you can get this through your head and in your mind, that I am not going to put myself in financial bondage to people when I don't have to, you'll be so much farther ahead than most of us. See, because when I borrow from a bank, I am a slave to that bank. When I borrow from an educational institution, I am a slave to that institution, to that credit card company, and you just keep on filling the blank to that friend, that family member. And, and maybe you've been in a situation where you've borrowed money from a friend or a family member or something like that, and it gets weird, it gets awkward, and, or maybe you've lent it, like they never pay it back and all that. I mean, kind of the rule when you lend to friends or family is you just have to expect that's a gift, and you're probably not going to see it again, and if you do see it again, great. But you've got to think about that when you make those choices. But he says, hey, the borrower is a slave to the lender. And we have enslaved ourselves to a lot of different people because we have borrowed money and gone into debt for things that a lot of it, we wouldn't have to. We wouldn't have to. And so he, he says, hey, don't get yourself in that financial situation um, all right, so um, Psalm 37, verse 21 says this. The wicked borrows but does not pay back, but the righteous is generous and gives. And so he's kind of comparing these two here. But he says, hey, the wicked borrows does not pay back. And we looked at this last week as well out of the book of James. And we talked about, hey, pay what you owe. If you borrowed it, you do everything that you can do to pay it back. Um, 
And you say, well, I've, you know, I, I have debt. Most of us in here have debt. The average of what every American owes tells me you have debt. All right? So what can we do to get ourselves out from this financial bondage and pressure? So first thing that we need to do is we need to calculate your debt load. Calculate your debt load. All right? So this is, you're figuring out how much do I owe and who do I owe it to? So whether you write that down on a piece of paper, or you take out your little financial app, whichever one you think is the best for you, and you're, you're literally figuring it out, you're getting that in front of your face so that you know this is exactly how much I owe to who, this is how much they expect to be paid every single month, what the payments are going to be, but you're laying out that debt load in front of you. Last week we talked about budgeting and how important it is to have that plan for what you're going to do with your money. And without, uh, there's a reason we talked about budgeting first. Is that without the budgeting, you're going to have a really hard time getting yourself out of debt. It's going to be nearly impossible for you. It's not going to happen. Why? Because you don't have a plan of what you're going to do with your money. And debt is exactly what happens to most people who choose not to have a plan. So we've got to have that plan. And we looked at the last week. As far as budgeting, I'll just review this real quick because you can go online and watch the message for yourself. But first of all, you're going to calculate your monthly take-home pay. Now, what they say they're going to pay you. All right, what do you actually take home? What's the dollars you actually take home and goes in your account? So calculate your monthly take-home pay. And I know we have people with businesses and your income is very random and everything else. All right, you can still figure out what your average monthly take-home pay looks like. And it, the, the more crazy your finances are, like ours are, all right, I never know what my paycheck from Beachside is going to be week to week. It's up, it's down. I never know when a paint job is going to come in and different things like that, all right? So our income does this all the time. And the more it does this, the more important this plan is of budgeting and knowing what you're going to do with your money. All right, so calculate your monthly take-home pay. Number two was calculate your monthly expenses. Um, and I was talking with Jerry about this, and he mentioned something that I thought was, was such a good idea when you're talking about expenses. All right, so we have, we have certain expenses, whether it's your mortgage, your rent, or your car payment, whatever else. Um, you can tell them when you want to pay that payment. So if they tell you, oh, we want you to pay on the 10th of every month, but that doesn't work for you because of the way that your checks come in, you can tell them, no, I'm going to pay on the 17th, right? So you're in charge of your finances. You're in charge of developing that plan. And so whatever those expenses are, all right, then I'm going to, have a, I'm going to come up with a plan on what's the best way for me to pay that off and make sure it gets paid off. And so we were talking about in, in our connection group this past week, and Delia was telling us, like, she's got a specific plan for when exactly she makes all of her bill payments to make sure that nothing slips through the cracks and it, everything gets there on time, there's no late fees. All right, she's taken control of that and decided this is the best time for me. You've got to figure out what's the best time for you. So we're going to calculate that. And then number three was really simple but the hardest to do. Carefully follow your plan. You got to carefully follow your plan. And we talked about, hey, it's the same with diet and exercise, right? Like we all know the system. It's, it's not like some secret thing. You got to take in less calories, all right, in order to lose weight, right? Well, it's hard to do that. It's really hard to follow through with that. We may get off to a good start, Man, that pizza looks good. Cheesecake Factory. Walked by Cheesecake Factory the other day, and let's just say I lost that battle that day. <laughs> All right, we know what we should do, but following the plan is the hard part. Same is true when it comes to budgeting and your finances. But you've got, you've got to have your plan, and this will help you 
here when we're talking about getting out of debt. If you don't have a plan for getting out of debt, it's never going to happen. It's not going to happen. And if you don't get out of debt, you're not going to be able to move to this place of financial abundance and financial freedom. So Proverbs 13 says this, talking about paying off our debts here. Romans 13, 7 and 8, pay to all what is owed to them. Taxes to whom taxes are owed. Man, that's a move on from that. But Jesus said, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar. Jesus said, pay your taxes. All right? Paul says, pay your taxes. He says, revenue to whom revenue is owed. Respect to whom respect is owed. Honor to whom honor is owed. Now notice verse number 8. Owe no one anything except to love each other for the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. Um, be a good verse for all of us to concentrate on right now, especially that, that last part, being a political season and so much division. But we'll focus in on that first part. Owe no one anything. If you can do it, if you can work it out, if you can make sacrifices so you don't owe anybody anything, that is the best way for you to find financial freedom and take control of your life. Why? Because if I owe somebody, I'm a slave to somebody. So whatever you can do to not be in bondage to somebody financially, he says we ought to do it. All right? So we're going to specifically map out what you owe and to whom. All right, so you ought to know my mortgage. This is exactly what I owe. This is what's left on it. This is how much each payment is. This is to who it's to. Um, car loan. If you, if you have a loan for a car, I would recommend you not doing that. Um, if you're working to pay off debt, the best thing you can do is not have a car loan. Uh, we're very fortunate we don't have a car loan, and we just bought a car. And off a of marketplace, we didn't buy brand new. We went and spent $3,500. $4,000. Saved up $4,000 and bought a used car. And I would much rather drive that Honda CRV than my minivan any day of the week. Um, but hey, if, if you cannot be in bondage to a car company, right? I'm not paying them extra money. And I can use that for something else. But if you have a car payment, all right, what is, what is the car payment? How many payments are left? Who is it to? Talking about student loans, personal loans, medical, credit cards. You're gathering up the whole list. What I owe to who, when does the payment need to be made, and all those sorts of things. All right, so first we're, we're going to calculate your debt load. Secondly, consider which payoff strategy. All right, what's the payoff strategy I want to implement? And there's a lot of different people that have all kinds of different ideas on what you should do to pay off your debt. What you've got to do is you've got to find the plan and work the plan that works for you. I often have this question when it comes to versions of the Bible. Like, Thomas, what's the, what's the best version of the Bible? What version of the Bible should I use? And my answer is always the same. Whichever one you'll read. If you won't read it, it doesn't do you any good anyway. So the same is true here. You say, what, what, what payoff strategy should I use? Whichever one you'll use. And there's a couple of them that are kind of the most popular and you hear about it all the time. Probably the most popular one. Let's put up, we'll put them both up there. So we have the debt snowball, which... You've, you've pro most of you have probably heard of that. Um, there is a guy out there with the name Dave who, this is, this is his preferred method. And so many of you are familiar with that. For those of you that aren't, I know we've got some younger kids in the room that may not understand that. So basically with the debt snowball is you're going to work on, you, you've already figured out what your debt load is, all right? So which one of these things is the smallest? So I may owe $500 to um, Rusty. I borrowed $500 from Rusty. And so 
That's the smallest amount of debt I have. So doing the debt snowball, I'm going to figure out how much payments I can make to Rusty to pay that off as soon as possible. I want to get rid of that debt. So I'm paying off that money to Rusty. All right, paid the $500 off. Now I don't have that payment anymore to Rusty to pay that debt off. So I take whatever money I was paying to Rusty, and then I put that into the next smallest. So now I've got even more money to put to the next smallest thing, pay that off. I've got even more money to pay off the next smallest thing. And that's why it's called a snowball, because it just kind of keeps building until finally you can knock out whatever the largest thing was. All right, and then we have the exact opposite approach to that. It's called a debt avalanche, where I'm focusing in on the highest debt first, whatever that is. Some of you that have $80,000 to your credit card, I hope you don't. That was one of the guesses, all right? $80,000 to the credit card, that's my largest debt. I'm going to work to pay that off first. And that takes a little bit more focus. Because right, at least with the debt snowball, you're getting some wins. It's like, oh, I got rid of that debt. That feels good. I can apply more. But if you work this plan for debt avalanche, it's like, okay, I, I have freed up a lot of money now by paying off this large debt, which means the second largest is going to fall so much faster, and you're going to be able to just kind of get rid of it. Now, this, the strategy in and of itself doesn't matter. But you've got to have a strategy. If you don't have a strategy, it's never going to happen. And for our young people who are in the room, your top strategy ought to be never get in that position. If you can help it. Never get in that position. Um, we'll talk more about saving and how you can set yourselves up, especially early on, so that you don't have to get in this situation um, next week. So I won't dive into that. But you've got to have that method, right? Turn to 2 Kings chapter number 4. 2 Kings chapter number 4. And we find an account here in the life of Elisha, and Nancy read a couple of these verses for us just a little while ago in our service. But I want, to, want you to kind of see what's taking place here. Verse number 1 says this, Now the wife of one of the sons of the prophets cried to Elisha, Your servant, my husband, is dead. And you know that your servant feared the Lord, but the creditor has come to take my two children to be his slaves. So this lady finds herself in some circumstances where she's in trouble. This was a totally different time period where, for the most part, wives were dependent upon their husbands for financial freedom and success. And so now her husband who's serving God, he's doing what's right, he's dead. They're giving their lives to serve the Lord. He's dead. Now they have this de debt that has built up. And the way that debt is going to be paid is the creditors coming to take her kids away. All right, they're going to work for me until that debt is paid off. So she finds herself feeling the financial pressure. Right? Borrower, slave to the lender, in this case, literally. And so, come and take, take my children away. Verse 2, Elijah said to her, What shall I do for you? Tell me, what have you in the house? She said, Your servant has nothing in the house except a jar of oil. Then he said, Go outside, borrow vessels from all your neighbors, empty vessels and not too few. Then go in and shut the door behind yourself and your sons and pour into all these vessels and when one is full, set it aside. So she went from him and shut the door behind herself and her sons. And as she poured, they brought the vessels to her. When the vessels were full, she said to her son, bring me another vessel. And he said to her, there is not another. Then the oil stopped flowing. She came and told the man of God. And he said, go, see, go sell the oil and pay your debts. And you and your sons can live on the rest. So... Beautiful story of God's provision here. But she's in trouble. She goes to Elisha. And I love Elisha's response, all right? He asks her a question. What do you have? What do you have? 
And, and this is the thing for some of us. Financially, we're in debt, we're feeling pressure, we're struggling, and we want to look to some outside source to bail us out. Right? And Elisha says, what do you have? All right, start with that. Because you have everything that you need to get yourself to financial freedom. You have it. It may take some hard work. It may take some sacrifice. It may mean getting a second job, a side hustle, or whatever else. But you have the intellect. You have the ability. As I mentioned, we live in a time right now where the opportunity for you to earn income in ways you never even imagined. People are making millions of dollars making YouTube videos, playing video games. Like, I'm telling you, there is opportunity there. So he says, what do you have? And of course, we have this situation with the oil. Many of you are familiar with the story. We just read through it. Um, and so he says, verse number seven, go sell the oil, pay your debts, you and your sons can live on the rest. So he says, all right, this is the plan. I'm going to work the plan. Go pay off your debt. That's what we're going to do. And that's exactly what we need to do. All right, figure out what is the plan that you're going to come up with, that you're going to follow. So here's a couple of things to help you to think about. All right, we're working Try to get out of debt. Try to pay some of these things down. What are some practical steps that I can take? So something to think about when we talk about credit card debt and over $8,000 for the average person. Um, here's something to think about. All right, this was back in May of 2024, so just a few months ago. The average credit card interest rate on accounts with balances assessed interest was 22.76%. So you're paying almost 23% interest every time you don't pay that card off at the end of the month. So your strategy, if you have a credit card, is pay that card off every single month. All right, young people, do you hear that? Like, never let balance on your credit card go by without paying it off. Don't have more than one don't have one for this store and that store, but I get a discount, I get this, and I get that. No, just have one to keep track of if you're going to have one. And make sure you pay it off. Because basically one-fourth, one-fourth of your money is going to them. Extra. So pay it off. All right, so I have this high interest card, credit card. What do I do? Well, one practical step that you can work towards right away and, and all of these will only work if you are committed to getting out of debt. All right, if, if you're not going to stick to it, you're, you're just delaying the inevitable of more debt. So if you're going to take this step, that means you're, you're committed to getting out of debt. But a lot of credit cards, you could transfer over a certain amount of debt to another credit card that has 0%. Because their, their goal is to hope that you won't pay it off, and then they'll get that 20-some percent eventually. But if you are committed, you can transfer that over to a card with 0%, so you're no longer paying that extra 22 23%, and you have that money to now pay down that debt. All right, so that's a, that's a simple step that you can make. Maybe it's debt consolidation, or like... I am so like overwhelmed because I owe this person this much, this person this much, this person this much, and I'm just struggling, and you want to simplify. It's basically you're taking all your debt and you're combining it into one. Now, once again, if you're going to take this step, you've got to be committed to getting out of debt. I'm not going to take my credit card and this and this and this and stack it into one and then rack up more credit card debt. Why? Because that's just going to continue to, to drown me. So you've got to be committed to it, but it's a step that you can take, all right? You can negotiate your payments. And we don't think about this much as Americans. We're just like, this is the price they told me, so this is the price I pay. Right? But that's not necessarily the case. So you can go and you can, what, on, on all of your stuff, right? Whether it's your, your cable, if you still have cable, right? You can go and you can work to try to get to pay less. 
If it's your phone payment, like you can work. If you're willing to talk on the phone and spend two hours on the phone to try to get to actually talk somebody, you have an opportunity to talk down and get a lower payment for your phone bill. Like you can do it. You've got to put in the work or you can pay somebody else to do it. And there's debt management programs, debt settlement, different things like that, where for the most part, you're going to hire somebody who's going to talk to the people that you owe and try to work to, so you don't have to pay the interest, you don't have to pay this fee or that fee or whatever else, and they're going to try to, and there's a, there's a cost that's associated with that, but hopefully in the long run, you're paying less, even though you're paying somebody else to do that for you. All right, but there's, there's steps that you can take even right away if you're going to be committed to it, okay? So you're going to first calculate your debt load, then you're going to consider which payoff strategy, and number three is exactly the same three as last week. Carefully follow your plan. Because if you're not going to carefully follow the plan, it doesn't matter what step you're going to take. You're going to get yourself in a worse situation. I'm going to transfer it all over to a 0%, but I can't really use anything on that, so I'll just get another credit card. Well, if you're not committed to the plan, you're going to get yourself and just keep getting yourself in it. But slowly over time, if you work the plan, you can get yourself to where financially you don't really owe. You might owe your mortgage, right? My wife and I right now, the, the, the only thing we owe is our mortgage. That's it. And it would be great if we could get rid of that bad boy. All right? Well, we're trying to work a plan so that we have an opportunity to invest in the things that really matter. I don't want to hinder that. And one of the reasons why I can do this here at Beachside, where I literally don't know what I'm going to be paid every week, is because we follow the plan. Because I'm not a slave to anybody else with what I owe. I don't want to hinder what God wants me to do. And the reason I want you to find financial freedom and success is so that you're not hindered in whatever God wants you to do. Whatever investment he wants you to make. So whatever that plan is that you've established for getting out of debt, you need to carefully follow it. You've got to be diligent about it. There's nothing, for most people, there's nothing fun or exciting about getting out of debt. Right? There's nothing exciting about that. Maybe somebody like Jerry looks at that and is like, that's exciting. I, Jeff is like, I love it. Let's keep talking about this. But for most of us, we're not wired that way. But it's, we just got to keep working the plan. Got to be diligent. We got to be persistent. You, however you can make it exciting, make it exciting to pay off that debt and get to that place where you have financial freedom. God has entrusted you with earthly treasure. How are you using it? How are you investing it? Are you being wise about it? Or are you wasting it? A wise steward will calculate their debt load, will consider their payoff strategy, and will carefully follow the plan. Matthew chapter 6 verse 19 says this, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also.